Good morning, everyone. My name is Hayatun Sillen, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and it's my great pleasure to give you a very warm welcome to today's webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on education skills. This is part of our, our STEM policy webinar series, and if you missed any of the others, please do catch up with them on the Academy's website, and we'll also be recording today's session. It's become a truism to say that COVID-19 has impacted literally every part of our lives. And we see that in the context of education and skills as much as anywhere else. Whether it's about the practicalities of how schools and colleges can operate safely, or the impact of time lost from learning on the most vulnerable children and young people, the focus on inequality and racism that COVID-19 has brought to the fore, or the sustainability of our university funding model, or indeed on the impact that the changing shape of our economy is having on vocational and workplace learning. There is no question that this pandemic has provided us with an array of meaty issues to grapple with when it comes to education and skills. It's also important to recognise that prior to the pandemic, engineering faced significant skills challenges already. Engineering UK estimated that we were short of up to 59,000 engineers per annum in the UK. And we have a very long standing and severe diversity deficit in engineering, with the UK engineering workforce comprising only 12% female and 9% black and minority ethnic engineers. So the disruption caused by COVID is actually overlaid on an already challenging baseline for engineering. And today we'll be exploring where that leaves us in the context of education skills, and what action we can take to respond. I'm delighted that we have a really great expert panel to help us navigate these crucial issues. First up, we'll have Rebecca Kramer, who's the founder and director of education at REACH Academy Felton. Then we'll hear from Ian Gaskell, who's the director at the National Forum for Engineering Centres. Then Professor Danielle George, the Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning at the University of Manchester. Then Dr. Oli Falayan, who's the chairman of the Association for Black and Minority Ethnic Engineers, AFBE UK. And finally, from Dame Judith Hackett, who's the chair of Make UK, the manufacturing trade body, as well as being a fellow and trustee of the Royal Academy of Engineering. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask our panelists in that order to give some short introductory remarks, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion across the panel. Once we've had a chance to explore um, a couple of the key issues, I'll be opening up the discussion to all of you, to all of the people in the audience. So please do have your questions at the ready and submit them through the, the sorry, not the chat, but the Q&A function. And if you can do that at any time, and I'll do my best to get through as many of those as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rebecca to give her introductory statement. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, as um, Hayatun said, I am the co-founder and director of education um, at REACH Academy in Felton. Um, REACH Academy is an all through state school um, for mixed students, so boys and girls in West London. Um, and our students are from the ages of two to 19. So we, we serve the whole spectrum. Um, and we have been thinking really carefully about our whole curriculum. We have gone through the process that all schools have gone through over recent months of moving our learning online um, and changing to a remote offer, um, but also maintaining some education in person for our most vulnerable children and the children of key workers. Um, and since the 1st of June, we've been slowly increasing the proportion of online learning that is happening and we currently have um, about 200 children in the building today um, out of a total of about 900 um, and we are now kind of turning our minds to thinking about September and what that looks like and in particular um, thinking about STEM subjects, access to careers education and how we really plan in the short, medium and long term so that our students who are nearing the end of their time with us, so our older students, um, can move on to the, the best pathways for them um, and how our younger students can have access to all of the opportunities that they, they need and deserve. Um, so in the short term, we are kind of considering the potentially huge impact of online learning on STEM subjects and um, thinking about how we can provide um, as much practical exposure as possible. Um, and arguably online learning is easier in art subjects. You know, reading a book is significantly easier to do remotely than a science experiment. Um, and so we're also considering how we can educate and upskill parents 
um, to try to provide that rich home learning environment um, that will enable the students to access all of the STEM learning that they need to. Um, and we're kind of acutely aware of the gap for the most socioeconomically disadvantaged. We have given out all of our laptops from school, so we currently have none in the building, um, because we needed to at the point at which we moved to online learning. Um, but it, it is a challenge, and we have some families where you know, there are multiple siblings using one device, and it is not sufficient for all of those children to really have a rich educational experience. So, so that's a challenge for us um, in the short term. In the medium term, we are considering how to structure our timetable for next year um, and thinking about how we can give students access to specialist teachers while at the same time following um, COVID-19 guidance around bubbles or pods or however we want to call them. Um, and also thinking about how we can get external speakers and events into the timetable and into the curriculum um, while still maintaining safety um, for the students and for the people that are offering those events. Um, and we're having lots of conversations with um, companies and people who we would normally have coming into the school building and thinking about how we can move things online. Um, and then in the longer term, we hope that for our youngest students, um, this period of time will be a distant memory when they are at the point in their school life where they're choosing pathways for themselves um, and hopefully through having conversations like this and working through um, solutions and, and access issues we can make sure that there is a huge um, take up of STEM careers and STEM subjects um, in the secondary part of the school but um, we are acutely aware that, um, particularly for the kind of community that, that we are working in, um, risk aversion is a huge issue. So, for example, we have only got about 30% of each year group who could be in school, in school at the moment, um, because our parents are worried about the risk because they read the media and um, sometimes things are not clear about the risk that is actually um, there for young people. Um, and our counterparts in, for example, Cornwall have up to 90% of their students in school. So closing that gap for the most disadvantaged is, is a real focus for us. Um, and the, the approach that we're taking in um, year groups who are um, not kind of statutory to come back to school at the moment is inviting the most vulnerable who have not been engaging in online education back into the building. Um, and they do have access to, for example, our science labs. Um, to try to close that gap as much as possible. Um, I'll stop there. I look forward to answering some questions later on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Gaskell, um, and I'm a director of NFEC, which is the National Forum for Engineering Centres. We're a national organisation that very much support engineering, training and education through um, a variety of mediums, which is seminars, regional events. Um, and we've actually got a seminar on next Friday, the 26th of June, to, to promote how, how um, engineering careers are be, going to be developed in the future and the certain implications that we've got through the COVID on STEM education. My other job is basically, or my day job, is that I'm a head of School of Technology, which is engineering and uh, construction and motor vehicle. And I have around about 1,600 students within the school, very much split between engineering and construction. Um, yes, since March the 20th, we've been um, undergoing lots of online teaching with students, seen quite good engagement. Um, and we've also hit some applications with students who've ha had barriers from home through lack of Wi-Fi facilities or lack of laptop facilities, and we'll try to um, support that wherever we can. Um, we're very much at this moment in time working on achievements to um, ensure that all students are not disadvantaged um, before they leave, which would be the end of this year, the end of June, um, and we can get all these achievements in. Some of the barriers we've hit through awarding bodies coming in late haven't helped some matters and we're currently working on that to try and get as many students back on site from next week as possible 
to make sure that they can finish practical work and to make sure that they can do some online assessments as well. This has meant that staff have had to do quite a few risk assessments this week, um, as well as we've had to get students to sign declarations before they come on site. We've had to make sure that um, parents and carers are okay with students coming on site. So it's quite a few implications there in a short period of time that we've had to address. Luckily, one of the main awarding bodies in engineering, VTEC for FE, um, Pearson's, who we work with, they offered calculated. So we've managed to get all of that completed by the 5th of June. And it was quite a simple process to go through using calculated judgments from staff on work that had been completed prior to March the 20th and graded outcomes to make sure that no student's being disadvantaged who wants to progress within further education or on a higher education. So that's done. Other award bodies, like I've mentioned, we're now working with to get achievements through. We're bringing students on site. I've got approximately 250 students coming into the college next week, um, covering a variety of areas. Obviously, we've made sure that risk assessments don't mean that we've got too many students in at one time, along with staff, and that we're following the COVID guidelines for this. Um, a lot of planning taking place. We have a, a planning day tomorrow as a college to look at um, how we intend to bring students back from end of August. Our welcome week to students begins the 25th of August. Um, yes, we are covering further education, apprenticeships and higher education. And we've got lots of discussions about what some of the impacts will be. And we've got apprentices, we're off the job training, covering 20%. If we lo start looking at only bringing in students once every two weeks, say, because of the two metre social distancing. How will that impact back on the 20% off the job? We are looking at the majority of our HE students coming day release to do HNCs or foundation degrees. How will online um, blended learning work? We've had some success. Will that move forward and will we have future success on recruitment if that's the case as well? And then with our FA students, yes, we have high volumes of students that come to us every year, round about two and a half thousand full-time education, full education students, and things will change. They will change, and we've got to try and make sure that there's no impact where possible on um, students and that they're not going to be disadvantaged with plenty of time where we can and access into workshops, etc. But timetables will change, and hopefully if it goes down to one metre, things may be uh, better for that. I think some of the things that um, of the impacts of the STEM education uh, on STEM education through COVID, one thing I am looking at is uh, we're estimating for and planning for an increase in the number of full-time students. Part of this is demographics nationally, but a lot of it is down to the fact that there'll be a decrease in the number of apprenticeships. We are forecast on that. And certainly that could happen in STEM subjects initially, maybe not as we move forward. But we are looking to engage high young people in the future in T-levels as well when they come on board from 21-22 as a plan for engineering and manufacturing. We don't want student aspirations to have an impact on STEM subjects through COVID. So we will be offering additional full-time students to students. But again, I think this will have an impact on the number of people or young people entering apprenticeships. And for the future, the engineering workforce, it's been aging for a long time. NFET is certainly an organisation where we try to um, address that where possible by giving advice and guidance out to colleagues in colleges and trained organisations and in higher education as well. But I think this is going to have a major impact back on sustaining engineering of manufacturing demands on contracts with the demise in the skilled workforce across areas of technicians, skilled guys, and ladies for the future, I think we've got to be, you know, really t take account of this and see how we can make sure that working with schools, that we're still encouraging, we're still motivating young people to come through and consider engineering as a future for them. Um, we try to address as much as possible the gender of balance of young people entering uh, ed 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 engineering. And as a, that will definitely con continue and uh, I'm sure the future when we start coming into um, T-levels 
and start yeah. running with sea levels. I'm sure that we'll start seeing um, uh, an increase in students coming through from that. So thanks very much for the opportunity to join this discussion today. And I'm interested to see what, uh, what questions come through and I'll try to answer as much as possible. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Professor Danielle George. I am a professor of electronic engineering at the University of Manchester and the vice dean uh, for teaching, learning and students in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. So that's about 12,000 students um, studying physical sciences, engineering, technology and mathematics. Um, as Rebecca was saying before as well, we've also um, transferred our teaching, learning and student experience last semester all of that provision online for about 40,000 students. Um, that was very much a short term um, thing. We don't want to be an online university. Blended learning is an extremely important part of, of any STEM degree. Um, so we want to make sure we have those asynchronous activities so the lectures can still be online. Um, students can decide when, where and at what pace they um they learn but then also the really important synchronous activities those sort of live face-to-face -face activities that are um that are really important and especially uh, for stem as we need to prioritize practical activities and laboratories education i think is sometimes um counter cyclical to to the market so demands for education actually increase in economic downturn um, the alternatives of, of unemployment or underemployment sometimes mean that um, students graduates wish to then stay on and in, in, increase their skills um, in the higher education sector in postgraduate taught programs as well so i think um, from a higher education point of view we have two two main concerns. Um, the first one is placements for our students and, um, and the practical elements of our STEM degrees as well. We've really felt a decline in the number of internships and placements um, that are available. It's about 40% less than it normally is. And, and of course, that's a really important part um, of, a, of a STEM degree. Um, so, so we need to make sure we're working really well with, with industry. Um, and providing all of those, those opportunities uh, for our students. And then, like I say, the practical elements uh, of, um, of any STEM degree, super, super important. So, so as, as a higher education sector, we need to make sure that, that our uh, future provision, uh, which will be more flexible, which will be more blended, which is a great opportunity, um, but we have to make sure that that blended provision for our STEM students must include that synchronous activity, synchronous practical activity, and really look at the, the practical and laboratory elements of it as well. So we have concerns, but, but also some great opportunities to work with, with other education sectors um, and with industry on how best to continue to prepare our students for that world of work. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the rest of the, the panelists' um, information and, uh, and the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Ollie Falayan. I am the uh, co-founder of AFBE UK, uh, and I'm also the chair of the Scottish arm uh, of AFBE UK. Uh, AFBE UK is the Association for Black and Minority Ethnic Engineers, uh, and we were founded in 2007 uh, in London, uh, mainly against the backdrop of uh, a number of social problems uh, for people from uh, black and minority uh, ethnic uh, origin. Uh, we set off with uh, a number of campaigns that went into various schools uh, to talk about uh, uh, engineering. Uh, and over the years, we've seen quite a number of uh, young people uh, make a decision uh, to become engineers. Uh, and uh, we also provided programs that support them. Uh, our key programs cover three key areas. Uh, we try to get more young people into engineering. Uh, we're trying to retain more of those people within the industry. Uh, and we're trying to encourage career progression uh, into positions of leadership. So when I think about the current uh, climate that we're, we're in and what my biggest concerns are, 
Uh, I'd just like to reiterate what uh, Hayatin said at the start, which is the fact that uh, many of the underlying, there were many underlying issues uh, prior to this. Uh, and in many ways, I would say that the COVID-19, uh, 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 the lockdown has followed, uh, has more or less uh, revealed uh, a number of uh, weaknesses and has been uh, a major strength test uh, for the system. Uh, we already have underrepresentation of young people at various levels within the industry, uh, whether it's going on to university courses, whether it's uh, looking at the number of students that are able to get into the higher tariff universities, uh, or the number of people who are able to get from university into work. So those problems were already on the line. What we now have is a scenario where quite a number of young people, especially uh, uh, families of, of uh, BAME origin, uh, who in the current climate are uh, having to ha have a future that is pretty much reliant on a teacher's prediction of where they're going to uh, where they're going to end up uh, and the the problem that this creates is that there are uh, there there are issues of uh, whether we like to admit it or not, teacher bias and various issues, uh, uh, you know, lower engagement uh, within certain uh, BAME communities, especially where they are of a lower socioeconomic uh, background. Uh, we have all of these uh, uh, issues in, in the background uh, that will mean that uh, students of BAME origin are almost inevitably going to be underpredicted in terms of their grades. Uh, and so my biggest concern at the moment is that we will have this huge uh, uh, mentoring gap, uh, huge uh, gap of people who would otherwise have chosen to go into engineering who, as a result of the current climate, may choose not to or may not be able to. Uh, and we also have a problem that the industry itself is undergoing quite a number of changes. Uh, and it's a question of whether or not we as an industry are well equipped uh, to address those. So those are the points I will highlight at this stage uh, and I will move on to the next speaker. Good morning, this is Judith Hackett speaking. Um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to, to speak to you this morning, just to say a little bit more about my background and uh, where my views on uh, education and skills uh, originate. So uh, as you heard in the introduction from Hyarton, I am uh, chair of Make UK, which is the manufacturer's organisation for engineering manufacturing type companies in, in the UK, the national voice for, for the engineering industry. Uh, but I'm also chair of Ingenuity, uh, which is the skills body also for engineering and manufacturing. And so I'll be able to talk about some of the things we're doing in the skills space. And a couple of other roles that I have. One is as a board member of HS2. So I can talk about the difference between um, public sector funded infrastructure and where I think that's going in the future. And I'm also uh, a board member of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, which is all about innovative new technologies. So quite a variety of, of experiences to, to bring to the table. I thought I'd start this morning just by sharing with you some of the challenges as they're seen from the manufacturing sector. So in recent surveys that we've done of our membership in Make UK, we're talking about um, about a fifth of manufacturers have somewhere between a quarter and half of their workforce currently furloughed. And a third of our members feel that the next 12 months or more is how long it's going to take for them to get back to normal. But what I do want to emphasize is that normal, new normal, will not be the same as old normal as of six months ago. Uh, we all know it's going to be very different. Uh, it's going to be very different in terms of how people work because we've learned things during this period. Um, and this is all going to have a big impact upon skills and the way people enter the world of work. It is different for infrastructure providers, for organizations like HS2, big infrastructure projects will get back much more quickly. Uh, they, are, they have a much more certain future. And so I think in terms of places that people will look to work and look to be placed in, in the gaining work experience, one of the areas we need to look at 
very carefully is that whole area of infrastructure and publicly funded projects because the future is much more certain. We also need to recognize that some sectors will be far more buoyant and I would suggest far more attractive to people than they may have previously been. During the last few months, we've seen some really inspiring stories in the pharma sector, pharma and healthcare. I think lots more young people are going to be attracted to look at that sector. Um, food and drink is also going to be a very buoyant sector, but people who aspire to go into aviation or automotive, for instance, are going to see a much more uncertain and difficult future in terms of finding uh, routes into where they would like to go and where they would like to work. Um, we're not just standing still, industry is doing a lot. Uh, the organisations like those I work for that support industry are doing a lot to help uh, some of these issues around skills gaps. We all recognise that whilst we're going to face a very difficult 12 month period where companies want to recruit but it's really difficult to recruit or to take on apprentices at the same time as you're making people redundant. Uh, so we know that we have to do some things to bridge this gap of up to 12 months. Something that we've launched in uh, Ingenuity, for example, is a whole new skills portal that we've put online in the last um, few weeks. Whilst we've been in lockdown, uh, we've pulled out all of the stops to create an upskilling platform for anyone of any age to get onto and learn digital skills. And we see that as being of value both to those who have uh, finished their full-time education and are waiting to find work, but also for people who are furloughed and need to think about new skills that it would be useful to acquire before they return to the workplace. Um, in terms of uh, young people and people who have maybe will ha as a result of this have uh, not necessarily been treated as they would have done through the formal education system. One of the things I'd also point people to is also on the engineering Ingenuity website. We have uh, a game, we've launched a game um, called Skills Miner, which is there particularly for those of um, lesser academic qualifications, but who would be good at engineering. And it aims to uh, take a different approach to identifying those aptitudes for people from uh, socially disadvantaged or those who, who may through, through, for whatever reason, not have acquired the right academic qualifications to be able to identify and demonstrate that they have the aptitudes to become engineers. So I, like Danielle, feel that there are lots of opportunities in this. It is going to be a bumpy ride for the next 12 months. And I think our challenge is for us all to use what we already have, make best use of the knowledge and ingenuity that exists among the community. The last thing we need are new initiatives. We've already got too many initiatives in this space but let's learn from one another. One final example from me, we in Make UK have a big apprentice training center in Aston in Birmingham. We're already open, we opened this week. We've done an immense amount of work in terms of understanding and using our industry colleagues to help us get that up and running in a way that we believe is safe and effective that knowledge we are happy to share with others who are trying to set up their apprentice training centers or their college facilities and, and more than willing to share that knowledge. So that's the sort of example from me of how I think we have to work together, do the best we can and, and turn these really challenging times into an opportunity to make a shift and move to a new way of working together. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panellists who's given, who've given us, I think, a great insight into both the, the real challenges that are being faced at the coalface, um, but also some of the, the opportunities, those, those glimmers of light. And I'd like to come back to those opportunities in a minute. But one of the things that is coming through on the, um, the vibrant inputs to the Q&A um, function on Zoom um, is a lot of interest around the fact that 
engineering and STEM in general are obviously subjects where the ability to do hands-on, practical, problem-based, team-based learning um, are, are really core to what we think of as good practice now. Um, so, as, as others have said on the, the panel, you know, we're disproportionately impacted by this inability to, to have um, the usual you know, classroom-based behaviour. So, um, I'm, I'd like to drill down a bit further into that and to find out what, um, I think we'll, we'll go to Rebecca, Ian and, and Danielle in the first instance, what you think, uh, what more can we do to cope with the fact that, that the, you know, the physical um, team-based, practically based activities are, are, are obviously limited now, interested in your thoughts on the, the changing role of parents and whether there's more that we can do there. Um, and then I'll, I'll come on to Ollie and, and Judith in a minute, but maybe if we could start with Rebecca and then go to Ian and then Danielle. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great question um, and one that we've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of months. Um, you know, I think the answer to this is the same as the answer that we would give to anything that we need to upskill and, and educate parents on to make them feel empowered to um, educate their children at home, whether that's online safety or you know sex and relationships education i think it's the same the same method which is um decide what it is that that we would want to teach the children what it is that's really important for them to have a very clear backwards planned pathway from an end goal which is okay if, if all of the students wanted to do um physics at university what should their physics education look like at the age of 18 at the age of 15 at the age of five at the age of two and backwards plan um, and therefore what exposure, what skills, what knowledge do they need to have? Um, and if some of those things are practical, then how can we show that in their home? How can we give their parents access <clears throat> to videos, guidance? Um, and I think we'll, we'll see things emerging. You know, if, if the children can't all come into school at the same time, then maybe we can have parent meetings where parents come in and we teach them a certain number of things across a range of subjects that they then go and disseminate in their own household. Like I think there are ways around this, but it, but it's certainly something that we need to have at the forefront of planning and at the forefront of our mind. Um, and, you know, as with anything, when we're dealing with um, gaps in, in disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged households that could be widening, we need to be thinking about the way that we, we are communicating, the fact that um, for many of our um, families and proud parents, STEM subjects may be something that they were unsuccessful in or felt unsuccessful in when they were at school. And we need to break down some of those barriers um, in order for them to feel like this is something that they can do and can do successfully. Um, and, and that's on us as education, as education specialists to do that. Thanks, and thank you, over to you now. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, I think, you know, part of it is very much uh, from an FE college perspective, uh, which we deal with a lot of apprentices as well. It's very much considered that, you know, students come to an, a college to do a practical work. And it's, it's very much probably 50% of any course for that. Some of the things we've considered and what we've put into place during the lockdown period is we've done a lot more videos, staff have produced videos, of practical work that students obviously couldn't have hands-on engagement with post March the twentieth, but it gives them the advice. It's similar to some of the YouTube videos that's accessible as well, and we're linking question and answer papers to those, um, which have proved quite useful. Obviously, going back, um, plans that we're looking in place now for post end of August. Um, we'll be putting certain measures in place where we're still going to be using some of the blended learning and certainly some of the um, resources we've developed for that. But also we're currently engaging with um, parents events where we've got those in online. I think a lot of colleges have done that nationally as well to show parents exactly how, what the future looks like. And also we've got guided tours of our workshops because we recently invested eight and a half million in a new STEM center so we had that in place anyway to give a guided tour and allow online access um, to, through our college website to be able to look at each of the um, workshop facilities that we have. And again, very much engaging with parents now to say, this could well be the future. So in other words, where we have planned in 
normally for say 16 into a workshop that may under the current regulations be down to about four young people but we'll have other activities and resources available to continue that education onwards from the practical activities they've done so lots of planning going into place um, we've learned a lot from it some things that have come out have certainly been you know very much embraced by staff um, and how an, a good example of this would be we put facilities in our engineering workshop on the lace and the miller machines where we've got cameras added to those where students could uh, or visitors could see students working on lace and miller machines and engineering equipment via a, a, um, a large monitor when they're access a workshop we've been able to put those videos into practice um, by having them recorded and again um, using those as a mechanism and a tool to be able to teach to. So I think um, very much the future looks bright as in the resources that's being produced, more will be producing. So we're trying not to disadvantage students too much on practical outcomes from that. Um, it's a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that will be met ongoing as we develop more and more and work with schools and work with universities to, to develop more for the future as well. And more than anything with industry, we need more engagement from industry with us, which we have a lot anyway, but certainly for the future, um, work with organizations to, say, to, to help develop our resources as well. Thank you, Ian. I mean, listening to you and Rebecca, it, it does feel as if there's probably an opportunity for more sharing of good practice that's emerging yeah. um, because schools and colleges will be in very different places in terms of their capabilities and also has been, has been flagged up by one of our attendees, Rome Agrawal, you know, there's a huge pressure being put on parents in the context of schools. Yeah. Uh, many of us, myself included, are learning to juggle um, doing yeah. your day job with doing a second day job, which is educating your children. So um, I think, you know, looking for ways to amplify those support mechanisms and things does seem does seem something that we could we could have a bit more of a focus on. I'm going to turn to Danielle um, and can you give us a bit of a perspective from universities but also of course you do a lot of public engagement personally you're famous for it uh, who hasn't heard of the robot orchestra so um, if you could also just give us a little bit of a perspective on how uh, that sort of STEM engagement activity has been impacted um, by, by the social distancing requirements and so forth. And then I'd love to get Ollie's perspective on that as well, because AFE UK has done a huge amount of STEM outreach, STEM engagement in schools and with young people. Um, so, Daniel, over to you first and then over to Ollie. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with Rebecca and, um, and Ian that there really are no alternatives to, to practicals um, for our subjects. Um, and but but what we do need to do um, is learn from each other and learn from different sectors as well and um, a lot of what universities are doing are trying to prepare as much as you can for the laboratories outside the laboratories and so there's great stuff that the Open University have for example um, on virtual laboratories so as an example if if a lab used to be a three-hour lab could it now be a two hour lab where you do an hour's worth of prep in the virtual environment um, for that laboratory? And so that there are some great um, software and platforms out there to, to look at the virtual side of it. Um, like I say, not, not to replace it, but just to prepare so that, that you really focus your efforts when you're in that laboratory space as well. Um, we, um, we are, like Ian was saying as well, we are doing a lot of sort of videos um, and demonstrations for, for students. So as the campus reopens uh, for universities, uh, we've got staff going in and, and creating videos, doing demonstrations so that students can watch those videos. What we also want to do as the campus reopens as well, but we still have a lot of social distancing, is maybe have um, the lecturer and some um, training, uh, teaching assistants there as well, and make the, the laboratory semi-interactive. So the students aren't in there, but um, via Zoom or Teams or um, Blackboard Collaborate, whatever platform people are using, you then say, okay, this is what I'm going to do with this experiment. What do you think I should do next? And so students are engaging with, well, I think you should do this in the wave tank or do this with a chemical experiment, you know, whatever it is. Um, we're also, as the campus reopens, we're also prioritizing um, final year students. 
So because they are the, the students that can't make up um, in subsequent years. And we're doing a lot of work with further education colleges to see if we can we can link up spaces and make sure that students in FE colleges can come into um, into universities as well. Um, in terms of outreach, yeah, the, quite a lot of the engagement activities have been um, heavily affected. Um, I think what I've learned or continue to learn is never underestimate the imagination um, of of anyone who's involved in any sort of outreach for STEM. The creativity of people have been amazing and, and the stuff that's gone out in the virtual environment is superb. Um, everybody wants to be hands-on, everybody wants to be able to, to be there with it, but, um, but it certainly isn't a, um, a vacant space at the moment. There is, there is so much activity going on uh, with it, um, and which is great to see and, you know, there is some, something called the Great Science Share um, that we do out, out of Manchester. And, um, you know, that has 64,000 people, um, part of it, children, part of it around the world. And they're all doing it virtually, you know, mm -hmm. so they've, they've, they've turned that bug into a feature and they're, they're all doing it virtually and, and creating stuff virtually this year. So I think there's, there are things that as we go into, like Judith says, the new norm, we'd want mm -hmm. to take things with us as well. Absolutely. Um, Ollie, over to you. Might just need to unmute Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, you can hear me. Uh, one of the, the three things that we've tried to do to engage young people in STEM uh, over this period, uh, we had a number of online sessions. Uh, we've done, we're, we're very much engaged with sort of mentoring of young people. Uh, and the third thing that we've tried to do is is think about the motivational aspect as well, because one of the impacts of all of this is uh, for a young person who's trying to get on to an apprenticeship, who's found out they can't get into an apprenticeship, it's it's also dealing with the uh, almost the emotional side of this as well. So, so uh, in terms of the uh, online STEM sessions, uh, we've been running a number of very interesting sessions. Uh, Fascinating physics of everyday life is a, is a, is one of the events that we've run, and uh, where we we try to use everyday um, uh, items that they have around the house uh, to understand uh, uh, aspects of STEM. Uh, so we've been using uh, marshmallows and grapes to describe uh, hydrocarbon chains and uh, we've been trying to explain uh, various concepts of, uh, of motion uh, but what we find is uh, we are creating a sort of virtual online space uh, which kids are uh, enjoy they sit with their parents uh, on a Saturday and they go through these uh, sessions uh, one of the last ones we had uh, we had about uh, 70 young people at this session and it was great because we had kids from uh, other parts of the world as well who were able to join and this is the type of thing that you wouldn't normally do uh, within the uh, classroom uh, environment uh, and so uh, the other thing is uh, very often um, where there is a lack of practical experience or lack of, you know, and we had these issues before, before, before the lockdown, uh, where there is that sort of gap, uh, I find that one of the most effective ways is for these young people to actually be in touch with people who work in those industries uh, and to have a conversation with them. And, you know, everything that Professor Daniel was just talking about just now, uh, almost preparing the child for or preparing the student for being in a practical environment, you can pretty much do uh, by having a sufficient level of contact with industry people. Uh, and, and then the, 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 the last aspect of it is a motivational aspect. Uh, we had a session just last uh, uh, Saturday where uh, our um, uh, STEM uh, outreach coordinator, uh, a lady called Dr. Renna, uh, actually went through a number of really uh, exciting videos, uh, uh, you know, examples of a of a, uh, uh, an engineer that had cerebral palsy who still managed to do so much in their careers, and the kids just find it motivating. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about all of those three aspects. Great, thank you, Ollie. And then Judith, we're going to take a slightly different spin um, for you, um, but workplace learning is a really important part of becoming an engineer. And um, obviously, as you, as you set out um, in your remarks, this is an inherently you know, challenging time as, as probably a massive understatement for so many companies and employers. Um, and, and certainly what we've, we've heard um, from, our, um, from our colleagues in a range of engineering companies is there's a huge will to continue investing in skills but actually it's a very, very tough time to be doing that. At the same time, we've seen some really exciting things happening. For example, 
in the Ventilator Challenge UK uh, initiative, um, the, the use of VR and AR has been astonishing. So they managed to do really, really sophisticated training. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in incredibly short timescales. Um, and, you know, there presumably is a much greater role for that sort of technology in training apprentices and upskilling and reskilling. And I'm interested in your thoughts on what are, what are those opportunities in the workplace and how can we best capitalise on them? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognise that, that, that getting people into real workplaces is, is very important and we need to keep pushing on that because it is an important part of, of becoming an engineer. But I agree with you that the opportunities for us to fill in the gaps. And I think as I, I, I liked uh, Danielle's uh, example very much, you know, in terms of when you're actually doing an experiment in the lab, the time you actually spend doing practical is a small fraction of the whole process. And in reality, the world of being an engineer is exactly the same. You do an awful lot of work, sat at a desk, and a small amount of time out on site building things or making things or whatever. So I, I think we, we can do so much more through VR, AR, through getting people into uh, virtual classrooms online. We can still do the socializing thing, uh, which, is, which is just as much part for me of being an engineer as when we talk about the practical learning of technical things we must not forget that getting groups together, small groups together, multidisciplinary teams to work on problem solving, that is a huge part of what engineering is about. And we can do that in this virtual space. There is nothing to stop us. Um, and I think there are lots of opportunities already where we're doing that. Certainly some of the organizations I'm, I'm working with are, are not just building virtual classrooms for large-scale teaching but also to do some of those problem-solving tutorials and small group work mm -hmm. and and I, I I think the opportunities are there and we need to seize them. Mm -hmm. Thanks Judith. Um, I do want to come on to another strong theme of the questions that um, I'm sure you're looking at as well um, which is to do with inequality and particular um, and in particular in the context of the time we're in now the focus on um, the inequality associated with black and minority ethnic engineers and um, there are several dimensions to this there's a kind of quite complex set of questions I thought Ollie you put it very well when you said that Covid has really shone a light on something that we knew was wrong anyway mm -hmm. and it's elevated it to a um, status where we can't continue to, to I won't say ignore it because I think that would be disrespectful, but to, mm -hmm. to allow the pace of change to be as slow as it has been yeah. is perhaps a fairer way of putting it. And I really would like to have your, um, your reflections as somebody who's been working on this for many, many years. I do applaud the work of AFB UK and you and your co-founders. Yeah. Um, and you know, you've created a vibrant community and you've helped to raise awareness of this issue amongst the wide engineering community. But the reality is, the stats tell us that there are still differences in the experience of people from these different groups in the workforce. There are differences in the um, progression of um, outcomes if you study yeah. engineering. Um, and tell us from your perspective, where you think we are now in engineering specifically, and what you see as the priorities for action if we're to harness this, this energy that's now emerging around this issue to make sure that, that we don't, if you like, waste this crisis. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one of the things I've been doing in the recent weeks because of what happened, uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd, is I've been listening to a number of speeches that were done uh, about 50 years ago uh, about the issue of race in general in society. Uh, and one of the things that I find really remarkable is uh, despite the obvious progress has been made, um, some of the issues uh, are exactly the same. So I was listening to a, a message from 1970 and it could be given in 2020 uh, because some of those issues are the same. Uh, the first thing we need to do is recognize that there is an issue. And uh, it sounds like a sort of obvious thing, to, uh, a, a strange thing to say in the current climate. Uh, but I have come across time and time and time again, 
uh, a general, um, it's somewhere between a general discomfort discussing the issue of race, people are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Uh, and then uh, the, the, other, the, the other aspect is often uh, denial that, that there is still a gap. Uh, but as you've rightly said, the, the stats show themselves very clearly, uh, the underrepresentation within groups, the uh, underrepresentation of people with similar uh, aptitude, if you like, if you're going by the A-level results who graduate with uh, first class degree. Uh, and the fact that quite a number of uh, being people are more likely to wait six months longer. Those stats are not in doubt, and I could tell they're definitely not in doubt, they're, they're my experience. Um, so, so the first thing we need to do is accept there is an issue. The second thing we need to do is, und is actually speak to the community. Uh, there's far too many uh, times where we have these conversations and we're almost building parallel universes in which we create our own narrative, uh, when actually simply making contact with people who know those communities well, uh, who understand them, uh, uh, you know, it will go a long way to dealing with the problem. Uh, another thing that I, I think is, is really, uh, re you know, really important is, especially in the current climate, there will be a lot of young BAME people who have been predicted grades that are def almost definitely going to be lower uh, than uh, what they are likely to get if they have the exam. So mm -hmm. I would really like the industry to think of a way to redefine fairness in the current climate. Because for, for many of those people, uh, you know, it, you know, may, maybe via an online exam uh, that, that everybody could take so that it feels that there is a level playing field so that we'd address the, uh, the gap with regards to predicted grades. Uh, I would like uh, very much that a lot of those things are, are looked at. Uh, and then finally, because I could go on forever, but finally, uh, the last thing I'd like to say is, is, is we need data. And I know there is a lot of data out there, uh, but very often there is a uh, there there is a reluctance to be open about things like the ethnicity pay gap, things like how many people are we getting into industry, things like how many people are we retaining in the industry, how many people are progressing on to become leaders. Those are things that you know uh, I wish they could be done in a way that anonymize the the people the respond all respondents so that we're not naming and shaming people. What we really need to know is what are the facts, not to, uh, the, the objective is. The shouldn't be to do that because obviously people can report things in a creative way that makes them look better than they are. So what, what we, that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ollie. Now, um, I'm going to give other people just a quick opportunity to add to that, but then I'm going to do some quick fire fielding of questions from the audience. So I've been weaving lots of them into what I've been asking you all, but I do want to put some specific questions and we'll take one response from, me, from anybody who feels that, that they're well placed. But before you do that, is there anything else that any other panelists wants to add on this specific topic around um, diversity, but particularly in the context of black and minority ethnic engineers? I, I just add, um, I think that there's an awful lot to do within um, higher education around attainment, the attainment gap um, between uh, white students Mm -hmm. um, and BAME students and, and what we need to look at is the, the sort of intersectional analysis you know we we know that many um, many of our BAME students especially our black students have um, have caring responsibilities or they come from low socioeconomic backgrounds um, and and so it's working with that analysis to say okay so it's not about the fact of a student being black or white it's about their responsibilities at home or you know um, and so and so working a bit more with that intersectional analysis so I agree with Ollie the data is really important to work with us um, something else we're looking at is more of an inclusive curriculum as well um, there's a lot of uh, we need to decolonize our, our curriculum and we found that that's really helping um, as well but there's an awful lot of work that we need to do in in higher education and, um, and, a, and a lot I think we can learn from, from other sectors in this as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to do some very quick fire questions. Uh, so um, the first one is from Johnny Rich, who says, do you think there'll be a widened attainment gap, particularly in STEM, based on socioeconomic background as a result of COVID-19? Who'd like to jump in? Uh, yes, I, I, I do believe there will be, uh, unless there is a proper management of change and real steps implemented to address okay. it. And then building on that, Linda Mann asks, the REACH Academy has an interesting approach to closing the attainment gap for disadvantaged students. What more can we done? 
and how can this be extended to support the disadvantaged across all phases of education? So Rebecca, why don't you give us your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so and I, I guess this kind of speaks to the previous question as well. You know, some of the things that we do, um, I think particularly effectively is engage with the community around issues that are pertinent to them. So during this period of time, we've done a listening campaign with our young people so that their voices are heard. Um, we're about to embark on a big piece of work um, around Black Lives Matters and, and hearing those voices in the community and making sure that they are represented. Um, I think that the, 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 the piece that Ollie just said about data and Danielle followed up on is really important. And sometimes I think that um, in schools in particular, we can have that data, but keep it very much for the adults mm -hmm. and, the, and particularly the teachers. And actually there's a huge power in sharing that data with the community, with the children and educating them, you know, knowledge is power and we all know that. And if we collectively understand the data and collectively find solutions, then I think there's a lot of power in that. And there was an earlier question um, and, and you mentioned the kind of challenge of trying to do your job and also trying to educate your children. Um, but the reality is, is that we know that if you grow up in a household with parents who have been exposed to other careers and have connections, that is a reality that they will pass that on to their children. And so we shouldn't shy away from educating parents and helping them to do more while also being really sensitive to the fact that there are pressures involved. And we know that, but as a community, we can support them around that. Um, and we also know that if a young person has, you know, four contacts with careers advisors through their school life, that they're more likely to go on to explore a career. And so we need to create those opportunities. And, and I think there are lots of opportunities through this crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of advancement in online opportunities um, and, and there's lots of stuff out there. I think it does need um, coordination. Um, and I think it does need, yeah, people pulling it together so that everyone has access to opportunities. Absolutely. Thank you um, very much, Rebecca. Now, John Chu has asked Danielle, how do you ensure the student experience for those who are on campus and off campus are balanced, especially when the practical components and face-to-face -face interactions will not be accessible for students off campus? Quick yeah. Question. Yeah, this, this is a very big challenge for us. We are, we are going for what's called a high flex approach. So a hybrid flexible approach means that we, um, we will be prepared to deliver everything online if, if we need to um, and then um, get on campus you know, whenever we can. But once we're on campus, most of the things that we deliver on campus, we'll also deliver online as well. So for students who, you know, maybe borders are closed or, you know, they have... Um, you know, care responsibilities or, you know, people at home, etc. Um, so, but, but the one stumbling block for us at the moment is the practical side of things. So, so we think we can deliver everything else um, in terms of small group teaching, academic advising, for sure the, the lectures. Um, it's those practical elements that we're really struggling to be able to provide a, an even um, provision online and on campus. Understood. Thank you, Danielle. Um, John is asking Judith, what are the ways you apply to the discovering of aptitudes in people who are not academically inclined that could have enormous potential to shift the entire education process and benefit disadvantaged students? Judith, your thoughts on that? The answer is very simple. So, so I've, just, I've just shared with Tom the, the um, website address that people can go to to look at that skills, minors, skills minor game. At the heart of it is uh, it's built to identify people who enjoy and can solve problems mm -hmm. so so the whole environment is is a is a is a factory uh, making electric cars and it it tests people's ability to to solve increasingly difficult problems um because at the end of the day in 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 my belief that's what engineering is all about that's what we do all of the time and so it it tests whether people uh, are able to bring their thought processes to, to making difficult choices, which is not about measuring how much knowledge they've managed to acquire in school. It's about the way they think. And that's what, that's what lies at the heart of Skills Minor. Thank you very much, Judith. And uh, Guy is just sharing the links um, that you've sent over. Yep. So have those. Gosh, there were so many <laughs> really interesting and important questions and we won't have time to cover them all. There are um, a lot around diversity and the need to 
make sure that we're not just posting black squares on Twitter, but that we're actually taking meaningful action. And someone also asked what the Academy is doing. Now, I don't want to use up this time to give a sort of advertorial for what we're doing, but I can assure you this is not something that is a, in the realms of marketing from our perspective, we very, very strongly feel this is a, an urgent priority for engineering and for the Academy to tackle this absolutely pervasive and um, hugely problematic diversity deficit in engineering. And perhaps we ought to have a separate seminar on diversity issues because there are so many comments. But I'm gonna ask the panel if anybody wants to give um, some favorite examples of concrete action that they see being taken by companies, by boards, by engineering leaders, something that they feel is falls into that category of meaningful action rather than just uh, messaging that's, that's intended to chime with the times. I hope there are examples out there, otherwise this is a really depressing <laughs> moment. Um, Ollie, is there anything that jumps to mind in terms of something that you feel is, is, a, good, um, is a good example of the sort of action you want to see more companies taking? Well, well I gave an interview. One of the reasons I, I didn't want to speak uh, on this is I, I, I wanted other, to hear from other people, uh, uh, but I gave a, uh, an interview recently where I, you know, my frustration was generally with the uh, deafening silence uh, from certain aspects and uh, a lot of performative, uh, well, what comes across as performative action. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, ha ha having said that, um, I see that, you know, one of the things that encouraged me recently, certainly from the oil and gas industry's perspective, and that's the industry that I work in, um, I've seen a, a, a genuine desire from uh, some very senior people within the industry uh, to really see uh, a change. And uh, the oil and gas industry is, is in the process of embarking on uh, an industry-wide survey. Uh, where we're basically doing the first step, which is on establishing a baseline and, and really understanding uh, what the issues are. Uh, I have also seen uh, quite a number of companies who've been willing to engage with us at AFBE, uh, basically to understand what they can be doing. And uh, just yesterday, we, uh, we, we had a, you know, a few guidelines uh, for uh, various companies, uh, just anyone knowing, trying to understand where to start. Uh, I'll highlight one company, uh, and uh, probably better I don't mention their name, uh, just in case. Uh, uh, but, you know, th there are some companies that have actually a very senior management level. Level, uh, started to uh, commit to understanding the problem uh, and you know that's in the form of uh, you know various sessions uh, they uh, you know book club sessions and, and various things uh, just to sort of educate themselves on, on the issue and that's encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think that... I could come in if you don't mind just to, with a, an answer what I've thought of. Um, yeah we were very closely with a large automotive organization in the Northeast without naming them, but it's probably quite easy to guess. And after a long period of furlough with a, a number of their higher apprentices, um, they've now met with us, made sure all the apprentices have re-engaged because they're doing a foundation degree within the college. And um, we, we know now that they're gonna progress forward with future apprentices. Um, Following on with each year, they take a cohort of 32 for higher, on the higher ed apprenticeship program, uh, which is really encouraging. And they're really embracing the work that we've done um, and how we are working remotely and how we are proposing, which is still at its early stage, is proposing to work with new cohorts who join us from September. So that's encouraging. And it's nice to be able to say that for the future, that it's looking good with them. Thanks for that, Ian. I, what I'm going to do now is, because we're running short of time, so much to talk about, so little time, um, I want to just give you all the opportunity to, to have a, a, a final word or two. I am going to be quite strict about timing. And what I'd, what I'd really love to hear from all of you is, you know, we, in this period of COVID, we find ourselves just awash with challenges. Some of these things, realistically, we can't do that much about, but we do also have choices in terms of how we react to the challenges we face. So I'd like to hear from you one positive action that you would ask of policymakers or the engineering community or STEM community, or indeed of individuals that you think will help us to make sure that we emerge from this period, capturing this opportunity for more radical change than we probably ever thought was possible. And to make sure that, that when we look back, we feel that we, we did a good job of harnessing the opportunity associated with COVID as well as managing the risks and the downsides. 
Um, so I'm going to go to you in the reverse order that we did the introductory um, uh, remarks in. So that'll be Judith, Ollie, Danielle, Ian, Rebecca. And I'd appreciate it if you could keep your thoughts quite concise just so that we can make sure we close on time. Judith, over to you first. Out, and I'm sure you're not going to be surprised what I'm about, with what I'm about to say because I already said it earlier. I think this is about using what we already have, sharing good practice, uh, pulling down the barriers and the elements of competition that exist between so many organisations who are all trying to do similar things in similar spaces. We've got to learn to collaborate, share good practice, because that's how we will move this debate forward in all aspects. Thank you, Judith. Oli? I would like us to, uh, just going back to something I said earlier, uh, redefine fairness with regards to the current new normal. Uh, and that for me means finding a way of ensuring that uh, young uh, BAME uh, students who have possibly been underpredicted in terms of their, their, their grades mm -hmm. have a means of demonstrating, because uh, they have that usually. Uh, I'd like us to, for the industry, just think of a way, uh, perhaps an online exam or something of that uh, nature, uh, that would enable fairness to be redefined in the current context. Thank you, Ollie. Danielle? Um, I'd just like to sort of echo what Judith said, really. I think, um, you know, we've got huge opportunity to, to share across different sectors, but also across the same sector. You know, we, we tend to feel as, as universities, we're all in competition with each other. Um, and as such, we, we don't share as much good and bad practice with each other. And I think sharing that bad practice is also really important. So we stamp out the bad bit and carry on with, with the good and great initiatives as well. Thank you very much, Danielle. Ian? Yeah, I think I'd just add to that. I think it's a theme very much along the lines of sharing good practice and learning from bad practice as well. That's got to be into the future. And certainly for organisations to help and collaborate through organisations like what I'm involved with, NFEC, National Forum of Engineering Centres, the good work we do and make sure that, you know, we're the voice of engineering for, for FE colleges and by collaborating, we'll work forward and we'll, we'll move forward with strength on this. And probably another one, support funding. And, you know, that's got to be funding. That's got to be supported for FE and apprenticeships moving forward. And again, it's high on our agenda as an organisation. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. And finally, Rebecca. Um, thank you. Uh, all great points. Um, so after this, I'm going on to a, a call about the kind of assessment system across the piece in schools. And I, I don't think it's just about entry to higher education where we need to look at that. We need to go right back to how children are assessed to make sure that there is fairness across all sectors of education and all phases. Um, and the other thing I would add is that, um, and Ollie said it earlier, we need to educate ourselves around all of these issues. Um, whether it's specifically about STEM or whether it's about BAME access and STEM, you know, all of these things, we, we need to not be knee jerk. And I think that there is a little bit of a tendency, um, particularly in schools to say, okay, well, we'll, you know, increase numbers and we'll have KPIs around certain things that doesn't fundamentally address the issues that exist. And um, the only way we can do that is if we really educate ourselves in the communities that we serve and we listen as well as take action. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and indeed thank you to all our panellists, who I'm sure everyone will agree have done a fantastic job of giving us a whole array of insights um, into the, the variety of challenges and opportunities that, that we're faced with at this time. Um, I've also been really appreciative of the um, myriad um, really good questions and comments that have come in via the chat function in the Q&A box. Um, I know that none of us are short of uh, Zoom calls or other opportunities to while away our days in front of our computer screens. And so I'm really very grateful that you've all made time to join us. And um, I would particularly uh, thank those of you who are in leadership roles and under significant amounts of pressure. We didn't talk about the pressures that teachers and educators and industry leaders are under right now, but it's been fantastic to have you with us sharing your thoughts and experiences. One thing I've certainly taken away from COVID is that um, we are capable of doing things that we probably never imagined we could or would when the imperative is strong enough. And I hope that we will take that spirit of 
um, envisaging more radical possibilities for change than, than we probably would have allowed ourselves a year ago forward into the way that we grapple with education and skills challenges in this next chapter. And the other big learning for me from COVID has been that collaboration is just so fundamental, both to how we, how we advance those um, positive changes in society, but also in terms of how we create the kind of society that we want to exist in, the kind of society we value. And I think that's come through really loud and clear as well in the discussion today. So this opportunity, this requirement to accelerate opportunities for mutual learning, for shared learning, um, so that we're not all having to go through individual learning cycles is crucial. The importance of um, self-challenge, taking personal responsibility for our um, perceptions and for the actions that we're taking. And um, I hope that the Academy and others of you will, will follow up, will come with us as we try and follow up on some of those um, actions that, that were identified by our panel in those closing remarks. Human capital has never been more important than it is now. And engineering and STEM capital is going to be a vital part of how the UK does build back from this incredibly um, deep crisis that we are facing. And indeed, the same will be true for many countries around the world. So thank you all for joining us. I've really enjoyed your company and I look forward to seeing you again at a future seminar. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.